My name is Chris and today we're taking a good look at the Rotel RA6000 and a brief look at the DT6000. Welcome to the Vinyl Attack. Attack! I must preface this video by saying that I did not do my due diligence when it comes to the DT6000. While I do enjoy it, and it's a great CD player, and it is sharp as a tech in its sonic reproduction, that style of DAC just isn't for me. I am more of a ladder DAC fan, and also I've been noticing that lately I have been much more interested in my analog setup than anything digital. I like digital plenty, and I do a lot of streaming. It's just not as exciting to me as speakers and amplifiers, especially turntables and cartridges. So for now, this will be one of the last digital reviews that I do, and it's brief in nature to begin with. I do have one more DAC from Denifrips to go through, but after that, I think I'm going to focus more on turntables, styli, things of that nature, because it just makes me happy. For inputs on the DT6000, you'll find one coax, one USB Type B, a pair of RCA outputs, a pair of XLR outputs, which is pretty fantastic at this price point, and considering it is a CD player DAC, and you'll also find an RS232 port for automation, something that I'm not really familiar with. You also have a 12 volt trigger if you want to use that, and a port for an external remote. The DT6000 comes in at 17 inches wide, 4 inches high, and 12 and 5 eighths inches deep, and weighs a pretty hefty 7.88 pounds. This is significant because a CD player usually doesn't weigh a whole lot, but this goes to show the quality of the build and the DAC inside. It uses an ESS Sabre ES9029 Pro 8 channel chip, which is easy for me to say. It handles PCM up to 32-bit 384 kHz through USB and 24-bit 192 kHz through coax, and it can also do DSD up to 11.2 MHz, and of course it supports MQA. So if you're looking for a DAC and a CD player in one, this takes up just about everything you would want and does it well. Concerning sound, the CD player performs exactly as you would expect around this price point. Its replication is crisp, concise, it is clear, and it sounds fantastic. The DAC does the same, and it's very detailed, and there's a lot of airiness and openness to it, but it's just not for me, as I mentioned before. I apparently tend to prefer ladder DACs as comparing the two, the Denifrips I have in home, to this, it just wasn't my cup of tea, and the ladder DAC is more my style. However, if you like the upper echelon, the finer crisp details, this might be the way to go, especially if you're looking for a CD player to pair with it, as it's an all-in-one package. But moving on to the RA6000, you might ask, what is that? Well, this is Rotel's homage to 60 years of Japanese heritage with some modern updates. What kind of updates? Well, it is room ready. It supports MQA and MQA Studio, wireless Aptex HD and AAC Bluetooth, and it is a Texas Instruments 32-bit 384 kHz DAC taking up the digital analog conversion process inside. It has three optical, three coax, a network USB, RS-232 for automation systems as mentioned previously, an external remote, two 12-volt trigger connections, a phono in, analog inputs for CD, tuner, auxiliary, two mono sub outputs, a pre-output, XLR balanced ins, and two sets of speaker outputs. It's got pretty much every connection you could possibly want. It's also a 350 watt beast with AB power into 4 ohms and a continuous output of 200 watts into 8 ohms. It's 17 inches wide, 5.7 inches tall, and 16 inches deep, and it's nearly 42 pounds. It even comes in silver and black if that matters to you. All this to say is this is a hefty build with a lot of power and a lot of options. To access all of the features that I've just mentioned and connections, you can either press the buttons on the well laid out surface of the amplifier itself or use the included remote control. The remote controls are also very well designed and cleverly used because pressing play on either remote controls for the amp or the CD player will work the CD player, but pressing the dimmer button will only work on the intended product, i.e. the amp or the CD player itself. The remotes are also backlit and they look really well and they're easy to read. For peripherals this time around, I use a pair of Bucart S400 Mark II bookshelf speakers that are still on loan from Mass himself. Thank you very much for that, sir. A pair of QED XT40i speaker cables, and then my Clear Audio Concept Black turntable. I included an Ortofone 2M Black LVB250, which I did a review on, and AudioQuest Golden Gate interconnects. Making use of the chonky remote, which is really big in my hand, I must apologize because I didn't get photos of the damn thing before I boxed it up and sent it back. 
I have no idea why, but the remote is big. I have larger hands, so I didn't have any problem using it, but for people who are slighter or females, you might find it a little intimidating, or you might want to use two hands to actually make use of everything. There were a ton of buttons. Everything did exactly how it should function, but how did everything sound? Starting with CD playback on the DT6000, I used a perennial favorite of mine, Back in Black by ACDC, as I know it so very well. Pretty much I found it to be a bit forward in its presentation. It was muscular and bright with a lot of detail, but it wasn't harsh. It just lacked a little something, and it wasn't as full and lush as I would expect. I also tried the new King's X CD, Three Sides of One, and I found it to be very disappointing. And it's not because of the CD player, because the pressing of the LP wasn't very good either. This is very disappointing for me because I love King's X and usually their recordings are sonically superior. Not this time around, unfortunately. So after that, I moved over to Analog and I stuck there. Starting off with the Tone Poet release of Blue Train by John Coltrane, this was an outstanding pressing and it sounded that in every step of the way. It had excellent instrument separation. The stage grit and texture of the saxophone was plentiful and the cymbals were bright and crisp and clear, not just clean on the drums. It was easy to hear the room verb with the trumpet being played, as well as the acoustic bass that sat naturally in the mix, even without my subwoofer on. It just kind of tied the entire rhythm section together. While this again was a little forward in its presentation, it still sounded natural, and I don't think I'm just used to this kind of open and airiness because of my usual amplifier, which is a Hegel H90. The Rotel showed the piano's ability to overdrive a recording mic in spots, which is to say that it saturated the microphone with so much sound that there was slight grit and distortion, but nothing harsh. This was in the recording, and the Rotel brought it out very cleanly. For me, though, it kept coming back to the bass and drums. The drums were very clear, the pairing was excellent between the two, and the bow used on the bass in the second track showed exceptional texture and resonance. From here I mixed it up as I want to do with Iron Maiden's Fear of the Dark. While this is a remaster from high-res digital pressing, it still sounds wonderful and is as clear as I've ever heard. Is this analog or not analog? That is a topic for a different video, but you know what? It was an analog record played through my analog system and I quite liked it. Bruce Dickinson's vocals had presence and extended far into the surrounding space beyond the speakers. The mix and balance was excellent, and the lead guitars had natural sustain that just rang for days that sounded as good as you would possibly imagine. The soundstage was noticeably wider than the speakers, and they had precise imaging. The snare was dead center, and the hi-hat just off-center as it should be if you know anything about soundstage in a recording studio. They put a snare drum right in front of the drummer, but of course the hi-hats are just over here. You can hear that slight offset with this amplifier. Of course, no Iron Maiden record review would be complete without mentioning the incredible bass playing of Steve Harris. It was obvious through this amplifier and these speakers that he plays with his fingers and the bass had good grit and texture all the way throughout. Overall, the soundstage in this album had great height and there was no distortion or sibilance. The album just shined all the way through with all the layers of the instruments and the dynamics. Switching gears yet again, I used a copy of Pink Floyd's Animals, which is a 2018 remix, but this is a brand new LP release. The dry acoustic guitars and voice in the intro were so amazingly accurate, I had to play it again just to make sure that I was hearing it correctly the first time. Not surprisingly, when it comes to Pink Floyd, the instrument placement was outstanding. The toms and the drums lived in their own space and they had depth and body. Keyboards were another thing altogether as they were ethereal in nature and they seemed to float around the soundstage as intended. They weren't meant to come at you in most of the songs. They moved in space and it was easy to identify. This is the sort of thing that I look for when an amplifier is in this price point. The stereo lead guitars used in different tracks by Dave Gilmore had different octaves and they were separated perfectly and exceedingly wide. The acoustic guitars just rang true and they were so amazingly accurate. If you've heard a guitar in person like this and you've heard it play through here, it's one of the few exceptions that I think it was captured as it should be. Many people talk about when we play our music through these stereos, it's meant to recreate live music. When it comes to sort of things like this, I disagree because this wasn't played live. When you're in the studio, it's cut track by track, but separating this one guitar or several guitars as the case may be, they themselves were absolutely as accurate as they could possibly be if they're being played right in front of you. Even the dogs barking were so accurate that for a brief moment I thought that they were outside my house rather than being played through speakers. The doubled vocals in stereo with harmonies filled my entire room, and again the vocal height and the spaciousness was on display here. This was a signature thing of this amplifier that came back again and again. And of all the albums that I played, I think that the Pink Flow is probably my favorite when it comes to showcasing the abilities and the talent of the Rotel RA6000. 
For amplifier comparisons, I didn't have anything quite in the price range of the Rotel, which comes in at $4,500. My Hegel H90, which is about two grand, was a little more on the dry side in comparison, and was also a little less dynamic. It's not stuffy, but it just was nowhere near as open and airy as the Rotel. It's almost as if it were a tad compressed. The soundstage was still as wide, but it was not nearly as tall, and it just didn't have that forward presentation. Not harsh, but in your face or just up front would probably be a better adjective. The $6,000 Hegel H390 is a little bit of a different tale, as you might expect. Now, to be fair, I didn't have a lot of time to compare these two amps side by side, as I had to send the Rotel back shortly after the Hegel arrived. That said, what I did hear in that brief time is the Hale is still a little more subtle in its presentation. It's just less forward. The details are certainly there. They're just not as airy. The black background was very apparent compared to the Rotel, and it seemed like the Hegel might have actually had more power in reserve, which is interesting considering the amount of watch that is in the Rotel. The soundstage, the height and width, they were on par, but the soundstage was not as deep on the Rotel as it was on the Hegel. There was just more depth to it. Then again, for that price difference, this is something you would probably expect. But for all of the positives, were there any negatives with the RA6000? Well, I found a couple. The LCD display leaves a little bit to be desired. With as clean, refined, and well thought out as the front of this amplifier is, and attractive to boot, the LCD display itself is just lackluster. I also didn't care that the dimmer only affects the LCD display and not the LED lights on the power and speaker select. This can be disconcerting in a dark room as the LCD displays are dimmable, but those lights are pretty bright and in your face. Also, there was the slightest audible hum in a silent room when I got very close to the amplifier. If you're sitting more than a couple of feet away, you probably won't hear that, but it was something of note. Also, some people just might not like the remote control. I wish I had a photograph, and that is my error, but it is a big, chonky boy. It is not heavy, and it is easy to use, but it's just cumbersome in a way. But does any of that have any impact on my final thoughts on this amplifier? Absolutely not. I have a feeling that the damping factor, which is 600 on the Rotel, might come into play when it comes to the open and airiness of the soundstage here. The Hegel's 2000 damping factor just kind of takes things and quiets them down with a black background, which is wonderful if that's what you're looking for. But with this amp, it's different. If you're looking for power and a soundstage that is refined and it has openness and shimmer, this is an amplifier that you might want to consider. It's not up front in your face as in it's harsh, but it will show you things, something I didn't hear before at least. Maybe it's because I'm so used to hearing my Hegel. Also, I haven't reviewed any amps in this price point in quite a while, but there was a lot to like about this amplifier, and given the choice, I would put it on my short list. Thank you very much to all of my patrons on Patreon who help support these videos. Thanks to you for stopping by to watch, and I look forward to next time.